Good morning. Wonderful to see you all here at St. Paul's. Welcome to our guests and welcome to our members today as we celebrate the second Sunday after Pentecost. For a few weeks, we're going to be talking about the nature of Christian faith. And today we're talking about how believers believe in God's power. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, you rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. In our first reading from Joshua chapter 5, we hear a familiar narrative, the story of Jericho and the walls tumbling down. In this story, we see God's power. When Joshua was at Jericho, he looked up and saw a man was standing there in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and said, are you one of us or one of our enemies? The man said, Neither. I have now come as the commander of the army of the Lord. Joshua fell with his face to the ground and worshipped. Then he said to him, What does my Lord have to say to his servant? The commander of the army of the Lord said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your feet, because the place where you are standing is holy. So Joshua did so. Jericho was shut up tight because of the Israelites. There was no one going out and no one coming in. So the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho and its king into your hands, even though they are strong warriors. You shall march around the city with all the fighting men. Circle the city one time. Do this for six days. Seven priests shall carry seven special ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the ram's horns. When there is a long blast on the special ram's horn of Jubilee, when you hear the sound of the ram's horn, all the people shall shout with a loud war cry. Then the wall of the city will collapse on itself, and the people will go up into the city, one man after another. So the people shouted, and the priests blew the ram's horns. 
When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted with a loud war cry. Then the wall collapsed on itself, and the people went up into the city, one man after another. So they captured the city. This is the word of the Lord. We'll continue now by singing our psalm together. This one is found in the supplement, the blue hymnal. It's Psalm 142 on page 60 in the blue hymnal. Our second reading, which will also serve as our sermon text for today, comes from James chapter 1. Consider it complete joy, my brothers, whenever you fall into various kinds of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces patient endurance. And let patient endurance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives it to all without reservation and without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. In fact, that person should not expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his high position, and the rich one in his humble position, because he will pass away like a flower of the grass. Indeed, the sun rises with burning heat and dries up the grass. Its blossom falls off and its beauty perishes. In the same way also, the rich person will wither away in his busy pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures a trial patiently, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God promised to those who love him. This is the word of the Lord. In our gospel reading from Luke chapter 7, we see the kind of faith that believes in God's power. After Jesus had finished saying all these things to the people who were listening, he went into Capernaum, a centurion's servant who was valuable to him, was sick and about to die. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, because he loves our nation and he built our synagogue for us. Jesus went with them. 
When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to tell Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself, because I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another one, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he was amazed at him. He turned to the crowd that was following him and said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And when the men who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen again to words of our epistle lesson, James chapter 1. I'll read verses 2 through 4. Consider it complete joy, my brothers, whenever you fall into various kinds of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces patient endurance, and let patient endurance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is the word of our God. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, do you know what it's like to be the low man on the totem pole? Maybe you're the youngest sibling, and you just know from your life experience how so many times it seemed like you couldn't do whatever all your siblings did. You weren't old enough, or you weren't strong enough, or you just weren't ready to do that yet. The low man on the totem pole means at work, if there's cuts, you're the first to go. Or if there's bonuses, you're the last one to get them. It's not fun being the low man on the totem pole in humble circumstances. And yet today, James, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, urges such people in humble circumstances instead to be proud of their position, of their high position, he says. And you think, well, that seems exactly contrary to reality. And yet, when it comes to our spiritual lives, that is exactly according to God's reality. For when we are humble, when we are lowly, when we have nothing, then we can rejoice in the everything that our Savior has given to us. Yes, faith rejoices in trials. Faith rejoices in trials. With unwavering trust in God's strength and with single-minded trust in God's promise. The writer of this letter is, is James And yet there's four different Jameses in the Bible that are named. And so we're we're wondering, what what James is this to understand the context in which James is writing? The one probably best known is the Apostle James who was in that inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John. That's, That's not this James. Another James, there were actually two Jameses who were apostles, who were disciples, The other one was known as James the Lesser. He wasn't in the inner circle, and yet he was a disciple, an apostle of Jesus. But that's not this James either who's writing this letter. The the third James is mentioned only one time in the New Testament, and likely this is not the author either. Instead, there's one more James. There's a fourth James who's mentioned many times. This is the brother of Jesus. This James, the brother of Jesus, the the stepbrother, the half-brother of Jesus, would later become 
the head of the church in Jerusalem. This James is the one who's spoken about in Acts chapter 12 and chapter 15 as that head of the church. It also mentions this James in 1 Corinthians 15. The Apostle Paul mentions this James as one receiving a special appearance from Jesus after his resurrection from the dead. This is the James who is the author of this letter. In Galatians, Paul speaks about him as a pillar of the church. And as James writes this letter, he's likely writing to Jews who have been scattered from Jerusalem after that martyrdom of Stephen. And they were a people who were plagued. Plagued by persecution and plagued by poverty. Both of these trials are mentioned in the opening words of the letter, which is the beginning of our text. Consider it complete joy, my brothers, whenever you fall into various kinds of trials. Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his high position. Persecutions, poverty, plagued the Jewish people in Jerusalem following that martyrdom of Stephen. And yet, how were they to react? How were they to feel about their circumstances, about their humble circumstances, their lowly circumstances? With what kind of attitude were they to view life? James says, rejoice. Consider it complete joy, my brothers, whenever you fall into various kinds of trials. Rejoice in your trials. Rejoice in your lowly station. Rejoice in your persecutions. Well, well, that seems odd. It seems contrary to reason. How can a person find joy in trials of many kinds? Consider it complete joy, my brothers, whenever you fall into various kinds of trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces patient endurance. And let patient endurance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives it to all without reservation and without finding fault, and it will be given to him. How can a person be joyful in persecution? Because a person finds his strength in his God. Even in that humble circumstance, even in that lowly position of persecution, he finds strength in his God. Perhaps in a way it's hard for us to relate to the kind of persecutions and troubles the Jews were feeling in Jerusalem at this time to whom James was writing this letter. Because of their weaknesses and because of the great power and strength that was coming against them in the persecutions because of their Christianity, they felt very low. And yet who did they have to turn to? If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives it to all without reservation, without finding fault, and it will be given to him. What is it that you need, dear Christian? What is it that you need? Your gracious God will fill it. Whatever you lack, God is able to grant it. Do you need wisdom? God is able to give it without reservation, without finding fault. There is a testament to the grace of God. People are critical of the epistle of James because they consider that it doesn't contain much gospel. They fail to see the book in its greater context of Scripture to recognize there is so much in each of us that could cause God to be reserved about granting us His grace. So much that would lead us, lead Him to find fault in us. And yet, in His grace, for Christ's sake, for Jesus' sake, He doesn't. Instead, he grants wisdom without finding fault, without reservation to us. Just ask. He has the strength and the will to give you whatever it is that you lack, whatever it is that you need. We, we may not be able to understand the kind of persecutions that those early Christians faced, but we certainly understand the pressures of society to have reservations about God. Pressures from society to turn away from God. To think, well, what can God grant to me? 
If this is the kind of life that I have to live as a Christian, is it really worth living? That is a form of persecution, not like the kind of physical persecution those Jews were facing, but persecution nonetheless. It's at those times that we feel pressure to have reservations toward our God. But we rejoice to know, we rejoice to know even in that trial, that though we may have reservations about God, God has never once had a reservation about us, has never wavered about us, even in spite of our weaknesses and our shortcomings. Faith rejoices in the trials of shortcomings with unwavering trust in God's strength. Listen to how James encourages us to ask for this wisdom. Let him ask in faith without doubting because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. You can understand that picture. A a wave in the middle of of the lake. As, As it comes crashing in on you and then the big burst of wind comes and, and the wave is blown in the other direction. Well, what way is the wind blowing for us today? What way does society drive us? What direction is the pressures of society turning us today? That's the kind of doubts that we have. Unwavering faith, unwavering trust, so often we lack that. What does God urge us to do? Ask for wisdom. To understand that even in the face of these persecutions and pressures, to doubt your God, you can have confidence that God and His strength will grant you whatever it is that you need. This word, unwavering faith, is the same Greek word that is used in the context of Abraham in the decision to leave Ur and to leave his family and to go and to follow God. In the face of everything that seemed to the contrary, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. He didn't have a son. And yet, what what does Paul say in Romans chapter 4 about, about Abraham? He did not waver in unbelief. There's that same word. He did not have that doubt. He did not waver in unbelief with respect to God's promise, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. God was fully able. And God in his strength gave Abraham the wisdom to know and to trust his God. And that God grants us the same as well. Not only did those Jews face persecution, but they also had to struggle with poverty. In fact, so impoverished they were that we're told that Paul, on his missionary journeys, as he's reaching out to these new mission congregations, asked them to give special offerings, special financial offerings from those Greek congregations who were were not well off themselves and who were new Christians themselves to give offerings to these Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. That's the kind of poverty, the lowly station, the humble circumstances that these Christians in Jerusalem to whom James was writing were facing. Such poverty, such extreme poverty would would perhaps make them doubt God's goodness to them. And yet God said, you can be confident. You can be joyful even, even in those trials that you face, even in this extreme poverty that you're facing. He says, don't be double-minded. Don't be a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We understand that picture as well the double-minded thoughts that we have. I know what God has said. I know the promises that God has made, and yet I can't help but think that everything that I see is to the contrary. God God makes a promise to me. He's going to work everything out for my good, And, and, and yet I don't see that. I see trial after trial after trial. 
and nothing seems to be working out according to my plans. I, I know that pro- God promised me, promises me grace and every blessing, but all I see is hardship and struggle. This is the kind of frustration that those Jewish Christians were facing too. And yet, James writes in this epistle, let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his high position. What a contradiction it is, isn't it? But God turns the circumstances of our life upside down as Christians. Those who think they are low are high. Those who think they are downtrodden and destitute are the richest of all people. And how can that be? The rich person who pursues his interests only in this life and for this life is the most impoverished person in the world. And he will perish even as he works to earn more. That's what James says. The rich person will wither away in his busy pursuits. And yet, on the other hand, the humble person, enduring trials patiently in this life, that one, that one has the crown of life. It has been promised to him by God, and God will not fail to deliver on that promise. And we don't need to be double-minded about that promise. Blessed is the man who endures a trial patiently, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God promised to those who love him. A crown. Now that endures. That lasts. Which would you rather have? A flower or a crown? Mothers, spouses, how many of you received a bouquet of flowers for Mother's Day? Or or for Valentine's Day, thinking even further back? That's nice to get those kind of things, isn't it? Uh, An expression of love and appreciation from your spouse, from your children. And yet that's a long time ago. Where are those flowers now? (laughs) Where have they gone? They're withered. They're in the trash. A crown, on the other hand, is made of gold. Look at how wonderful that treasure is. How much more blessed that is that you have as a Christian. It may look like this life that we have is nothing, is worthless. But God has given us a crown, something that lasts, something that endures. Listen to what James writes again. Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his high position and the rich one in his humble position because he will pass away like a flower of the grass. Indeed, the sun rises with burning heat and dries up the grass. Its blossom falls off and its beauty perishes. In the same way also, the rich person will wither away in his busy pursuits. That's the way of the glory of this world. A rich man toils. He strives. He labors and works and cares and, and, and completely expends himself just for wealth. And then what? He will wither away in his busy pursuits. We don't struggle with the trial of, of poverty like those, those Jewish Christians in Jerusalem did. But, but I think our struggle is just the opposite. We, we struggle after those pursuits of wealth. And as we so, so with, with great effort, strive after all of, those, all of those earthly blessings, all of those possessions in this life, we fail to see that, that, that those things wither and die like a dried up flower. And, and so does that rich man who chases after them in pursuing them and all his successes. But here is a crown. Here in this place is a crown of gold that will not waste away or wither or perish. And what do we do as we enter this house? We're encouraged. Encouraged to endure trial patiently. Because we know the struggles of being a Christian. That life may not turn out just the way that we would dream. Not turn out just the way that we have planned. And we know that there will be hardships for following Christ. 
crucifying the flesh, firmly trusting throughout life in the blessed promises that God gives us in Jesus. Promises that you rarely see, you rarely have the concrete evidence of. And yet the promises are there still the same. We persevere through this life in the face of such trials, trusting that there is a crown waiting for us in heaven which is won for us through Jesus. And that crown will never pass away. Human life is much like a flower. It can be beautiful. But the splendor is so brief in this big, vast picture of human life. It quickly dies and all its glory fades away. But our life, not just any life, but our life as a Christian is more like a a crown than a flower. Because we have been given an eternal life through Jesus Christ who came to this earth to suffer and die for our sins, for our failings and our shortcomings. And in Christ, we have a most blessed promise of eternal life. The one who died came back from the dead to assure us that we too will live, that though this life perishes, though this life fades away, that life which Jesus has won for us will not. Blessed is the man who endures a trial patiently, Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God promised to those who love him. That's the promises of God. Is God able to do this or isn't he? Wavering. Will God keep this promise or won't he? Double-minded. These are the trials that plague us, the souls of the believers. Persecution or poverty, whether it's struggling with the flesh or trials with those physical blessings that God grants us. Wavering and double-minded thinking still beset us. Is God able? Will he do? God grant us a faith that is joyful. Even in the midst of these trials, consider it complete joy whenever you fall into various kinds of trials, James says. Rejoice, because you have an unwavering trust in God's strength. And rejoice, because you have not a double-minded, but a single-minded trust in God's promise. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus, your Savior. Amen. We now join in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll use the responsive prayer of the church on page 42 in the front of your hymnal. We also remember in our prayers the family of Alice LeBeau. Alice LeBeau passed away this past Monday, a Christian funeral here uh, on Friday. And we rejoice in that crown of life that God has granted to her. And we pray that God would strengthen the family even as they mourn her loss in this life. Let us pray. Lord God, our Maker and Preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature.
Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Lord, we praise you for the gift of faith which you granted to your servant Alice LeBeau in her life here on this earth. She now rests from her labors and enjoys eternal peace with you at home in heaven through the merits of Jesus Christ. Comfort her family and all who mourn her death with the precious assurance of the resurrection from the dead and eternal life in heaven for all believers. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. And we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen.